wrestling. He's the inventor of the Canadian Destroyer. It's Petey Williams. How's she going, eh? We have a guy that's been at like just about every rock club in the world. Just the cornerstone of punk music. One of the guys I get excited to talk to every week. It's Lars Fredrickson. How you guys doing? He's won four Stanley Cups. Not one, not two, not three, but four Stanley Cups. He is Detroit's favorite son. He's got multiple radio shows. He is the cornerstone of Detroit media. It's Darren McCarty. What's up, fellas? Guys, I'm excited about today's show. We've had a lot of young AE talent, AEW talent come in and out of this podcast. And each one of them always mentioned one name. And it's QT Marshall as a guy who helped elevate them to the status they're in. I reached out to him. Him and AEW made it possible that they are sitting here right now to talk wrestling with us. It's QT Marshall, everybody. Yeah, baby. Yeah. All right. What's going on, guys? You know, I'll start this off because I'm a huge fan of yours, just like everybody else on this podcast. And you're a guy that kind of does it all. You have your fingerprints on just about every aspect of the company. And when before we hit record, you and PD were talking about times, you know, in, in indie shows all around and you guys have done here and there. You look back from where you are now to where where you started. Is this where you want to be as as part of the company doing what you're doing there behind the scenes? Are you more of a on screen guy or behind the scenes guy? How's that work? So real quick, this is not your guys fault. We just decided today that I was going to be a complete jerk off with it. Sorry for the language. The name is QT Marshall. So from this point forward, we're going to correct everybody. Uh, That's what it was. But I never realized that I had the pull to change people's perspective until now. So now today we we announced it. It is official. Uh, So but now to go to your question. No, I never once for a million years thought I was going to work behind the scenes. Uh, But it seemed like in 2019, when AEW first started, that was the only way that I was going to get my foot in the door. You know what I mean? It was uh, what I was doing kind of behind the scenes at Ring of Honor when I was doing the Women of Honor commentary. Um, I had my school, all this stuff going on. And then Cody needed an assistant. So that's the biggest misconception about myself. When AEW started, I wasn't presented two contracts. I was presented to be Cody's assistant, and that was it. And then I realized right away, this is a small, is a huge company, but with a small infrastructure. If you just work really hard, there's going to be jobs that people don't realize need to be done. So if I just do them, eventually, when I ask to wrestle, they can't say no. So that's kind of that was my mentality going into it. Um, so and one thing, and then I, they realized I was just really good at this job but that's it's not that i'm really good at it i just don't make myself out to not be good at it you know like i google stuff if i don't know what it means or you know i'm just i have common sense and a lot of this world you just need common sense sometimes to get ahead so uh no to answer your question no i didn't think i would be here i'm more of a performer um although i'm a lot more serious than i used to be when i used to perform on those indie shows that we were discussing before i have a more of a serious character now um, it's just who I am. You know, I take very, wrestling very seriously. I'm not out there to have fun and lollygag around. And I'm here because this is what I love to do. I have six screws in my neck because of it. So I don't take it lightly. I train four nights a week for it. So when you see someone out there like myself, that is very serious. It's not because I'm portraying a, a dull character. <laughs> I am just a serious human being when it comes to uh, what we do inside the ring. All right. Well, so if we could be serious uh, right now, I'm, I'm joking, Lance Storm. Anyways, um, so I, I got the impression that, you know, I, I know you work behind the scenes, but I got the impression that and, and maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm right. I, I don't know that you're a producer, like an like an agent. So do you agent produce matches? And, you know, if that's the case, like, you know, I, I look at um you know even doing the stuff with ring of honor and stuff like that and you look at other agents uh in the company you know i would say maybe you got the least experience when it comes to like producing television Mm -hmm. um do you think like you just like caught on quick or somebody took you under your wing or you're just like hey i I know how to do this so 
I, I guess um, that's a good question. Yeah, a little, a little bit of the last one. Uh, I remember in Ring of Honor. So I was trained originally at the Monster Factory, and then I went to Bubba the Devons, and I really learned under Bubba for a while. And Bubba was in Ring of Honor towards the end of when I was there. And I remember, like, I pitched being an agent and doing all of the things I do at AEW. And I remember Bubba telling me, like, how are you going to tell me how to wrestle? How are you going to tell Jay Lethal how to perform? And I was like, no, I'm, I understand that I'm not going to do that. What I'm going to do is get the, what the boss wants, relay it to you guys, and it's your job to friggin' make your magic. You know, I'm not going to tell you how to do what you do very well, but I will tell you what the – so a lot of it is perspective. And I think going into AEW – uh, the, the perception of me was that I am good at these things. So, and then it's trial by fire. And then the first match I ever produced uh, or coached as we, in AEW, we call them coaches. Okay. So was Cody versus Dustin. Again, I don't need to do anything except call the shots to the truck and, you know, maybe give a little bit of input and basically work with Dustin behind the scenes and make sure that he, you know, so that was, that was my, uh, my role there. So my first match I ever coached was a five-star match. Sorry, toot my own heart. No. Uh, and that was all them, but it is good to have on the resume. Now, the other thing is when it, when they say producer is that uh, like WWE uses producer in that realm. So I do coach matches for the younger talent, jungle boy, these guys that, you know, they, or that give them ideas. And I let a lot of the other guys do it, but like right now, um, like Dean Malenko was producing all of Jericho's matches. Well, Dean was in the crowd for Cody versus Jericho. So Cody told Jericho, well, hey, we're going to use QT. And I remember like the look on Chris's face, like what? We're going to do what? You know, and it was like, then they wanted to come up with some ideas. And luckily I've been on the Indies for so long. I had a good idea. And it was like, well, if you put him in the walls, you could stomp his head. And that would make MJF throw a towel in because I seen Roddy Strong do this and blah, 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 blah. And Chris was like, man, like, that's a really good idea. Like, you know what? You're going to be my agent from now on. If Dean's not around, I'm like, oh, shit, you know, like that's not <laughs> going to look good compared to the other, you know? So uh, I think it's, I'm trustworthy. I work really hard. And if I don't know the answer, I go and find out. But I'm also a producer on the other aspect where I'm the bridge between the talent and production, right? Because we use um, Keith Mitchell and his crew. Yep. So they're not in our creative meetings. They're not sitting there when we're going over how these shots are going to look. And so there has to be somebody to do all that. And in the beginning, it was me. And I've developed a relationship with them where I'm in the truck until about seven o'clock at night on a live dynamite show, you know, going over everything. And then, you know, I put my working boots on, I go out there, wrestle, come back, put the headset on. So I just want to be a part of everything, you know, and sometimes people don't like that, but I don't, I don't care. You know what I mean? Like, and again, I want, as to make as much money as possible in this business. So if there's money out there to be made and I got to work a little harder for it, so be it. And I realize not people so much in AEW, but just in life, a lot of people are good coasting and I don't want to do that. You know, I've wasted too much time to, I'm 35, you know, so I'm not a spring chicken, but I'm also not 50 yet. So uh, not that there's anything wrong with that, but Ow. You know, Ow. So, like I said, I mean, oh, you know, Lord, you are right over there. So, you know, like I said, it's just something that uh, I just try to work as hard as I can and, and keep good relationships with everybody. And above all else, I try to be as trustworthy as possible uh, to the talent. And, you know, when people ask questions, I get the answer for them. And that that goes a long way, especially in this business when you're used to, you know, everyone faving you on everything. Well, you know, I mean, I wanted to ask you um, about the training, but you sort of answered my question a lot because when I have seen you wrestle, you do have a little of that Bubba Ray kind of thing. And I wanted to kind of talk a little bit about that yeah. um, because it seems like the way, um, well, I, I wanted to actually switch the question because you're talking about guys like Jungle Boy and you talk about the Indies and stuff like that. And I've seen Jungle Boy on the Indies for a couple of years. And the next thing you know, he's popping up on the TV. And I feel like that a lot of the guys that I used to see in the Indies on AEW are, are on AEW now. Um, do you think that's helping that helping that company bringing that kind of style? Um, it's a little bit more, um, you know, sort of Wild West kind of thing. Do you think that's making you guys sort of different from the other companies? Yes and no. Um, I think it has its positives. If there are any negatives, it's that, you know, they're not taking the time in between to enjoy and let the fans enjoy and digest, right? That's the one thing that Bubba always taught us was like, 
you know, you got to let them digest what you're giving them or else they're just going to spit it back up like a baby. So there's, there's that stuff. But again, like even as a coach, I think, and I tell this all the time too, like Billy Gunn is my coach sometimes. Now here I am telling Billy Gunn what I'm going to do. That's absurd. But what we want is we want us to go out there, do what we do, come back and then have the critiques. Because it's very easy for me to say, Lars, I'm going to have you go out there and you're going to do X, Y, and Z. And then you're going to go out there and do it and come back. Well, what did you really learn? You know what I mean? Especially in the pandemic era when there's no audience to really feed off of. So what did you really learn? You learned how to listen to your coach and go out there and do it, which is is great. But I would rather see what you're what you're thinking and what you think is great. Because sometimes junk, a guy like Jungle Boy, he thinks of things that I've never even come close to thinking about. And then it turns out that it's one of the coolest things I've ever seen. And it makes sense. And, you know, whereas if he brought it to me beforehand, I might say, hey, I'm, I don't know if I would do all that. You know what I mean? Because I do have a, a little bit of a different mentality when it comes to wrestling. You know, I've opened up my my eyes to the difference, uh, the different sides of pro wrestling with AEW because you kind of have to. Um, so I'm not saying I enjoy all of it, but I think we, we give everybody we give the buffet of wrestling. That's for sure. I, you know, one of, I'm a huge fan and the QT Marshall that I, and, and to see your love of the business, like to watch the Mondays to watch being the elite. That's great. But Sammy's vlog and Fuego and the story, cause I'm the storyline guy, right? Sure. So I got to follow all this and, and just the, the reality of, I guess, veteran young guy and just all the way you intertwine it. I think that that, that is a blessing to the fans that want to in, indulge. So when it goes to like when the, the nightmare factory and you did the big turn and to, to the factory and stuff and, and did all that and you had Dustin and you had Cody up and right, had all that, the way that that made so much sense and everybody breaking out the, in the, in the factions, how long does that take to like the storylines to evolve and how is it because you guys are having as much fun as it looks like you're having because there really isn't a creative boundary if it makes sense is that what i'm seeing because i'm seeing like you just talked about jungle boy offering you some advice or saying he wanted to do things like it seems like everybody has input and everybody's heard at, you know to make the best product Sure. I mean, uh, you know, obviously on Sammy's vlog, there's there's no filter. Um, and I realized that, you know, teaming with Dustin, as great as it is and was, uh, I kind of was, there was only so much I could do, right? Uh, Tony Khan, our boss, he is the be all end all. So when it comes to TV, dark elevation, all that stuff, if he doesn't want it, you're not getting it no matter what. You can try to sell him on it, but he's highly intelligent. So, uh, but with that being said, you know, <laughs> Emmy's vlog gave the freedom to show personality because on TV, there's there's only so much time. And when it came to cutting promos, Dustin got more of the time to cut and he earned that. So I'm not going to. So I just went and found a different route. Um, being a Cody guy, Cody's not on BTE, so I didn't really go to the BTE. You know, I, I went to Sammy. I'm friends with Sammy. And a lot of that stuff I was talking about was true. Like you wouldn't believe how many uh, wrestlers email me or text me on a live dynamite day asking me about bookings. Like when I turned on Cody, I had kids texting me and I'm thinking like, I'm in the ring right now. You know what I mean? I came back and I'm like, oh man, they must've saw the turn. It must be a congrats or this, that, or the other. I hate you. And it's like, Hey, can we get booked? And I'm thinking like, can you have any common sense whatsoever? Like the stuff that we talk about on those vlogs, that's a hundred percent real. And that's what we call like ribbing on the square. Like if I, if I tell you, Brian Pillman Jr., you're a first generation piece of shit and you bother me, like it's cause you bother me. Like I'm sitting there doing work one day at the hotel and he comes up to me and I'm, he's got his dog and I'm like, Hey man, I, I'm not a big fan of dogs and I'm working right now. Like stay away from me. And he's like coming over to me, still trying to tease me. It's like, dude, what part of like, maybe there's something. So again, I digress, you know, but he is a first generation piece of shit, you know? Well, there you go. That's why you are QT Marshall. The <laughs> fucking know, I, prick. I, I, the prick. Think, yeah. You well, know? you know, I think I just like to be honest and people don't like honesty. So, and I'm okay with being honest. I think I'm in a position where, you know, of course I love my job and I don't ever want it to go away, 
but I don't think anyone's ever going to get mad at me for telling them the truth. You know, at least I hope not. Amen. March 5th, Blood and Guts is coming up in a few days. It's a pay-per-view or a TV view. I'm excited to watch you face off against Cody. And we've talked to many guys who face off against their best friends in the ring, and we get conflicting reports from these guys. Sometimes they're easy to work with. Sometimes it's tough. When you step in with a business partner, partner like Cody, is there more pressure on your shoulders to perform? Is it going to be a kind of relax for you? How do you feel stepping into a match like this? There's a lot of pressure because, again, the whole reason I, I did this, that I formed a factory and we've done this, is to get respect. You know what I mean? Like, at the end of the day, that's literally what it was about. It was about getting the fans to realize that I'm not just Cody's assistant. I'm not just <laughs> a partner. You know what I mean? Like, what the fuck? Like, I've been training for this for, you know, 17 years. Like, I'm good at this. I was, you know, like I was in Ring of Honor, for instance, right? And I went to one of those paid tryouts because someone told me to do it. And I went, it was like $300. I got the job on the spot. And that doesn't mean I'm the greatest wrestler in the world. That means I was better than 40 other people there. But on top of that, like the reason I didn't succeed in Ring of Honor was all my backstage shenanigans that I believed my own BS at the time. So now I'm smarter. And I understand that you can't act like that certain times. And also they were paying me a hundred dollars a match. So fuck you. Uh, <laughs> you know, that's not a real job. So, and I understand it's opportunity, but you don't pay for someone an opportunity. I don't believe in that. Um, yeah. So anyway, long story short, now I'm in a position where, you know, it's live TV. It's, you know, TNT, this is primetime TV stuff. The past two weeks I've been on, I read all the comments, people, oh, we're going to sleep. This is the sleeper match. Bullshit. Billy versus me had the highest demo rating, the highest in the whole show. So you, Billy Bravo. goes as far, you know, the storyline is great. Like, I don't care. Um, so Wednesday is going to be no different. Wrestling Cody, it, it, it will be a little nerve wracking because, again, if I don't win, you know, then all this stuff could be for nothing. But at the end of the day, too, I think I'm already winning. Right. Like. I've already won because I think the point has come across now that QT is someone that you don't want to, you don't want to mess with. And he's got the factory and it's highlighting three younger talents that all have tremendous, tremendous potential. I mean, Anthony Agogo, uh, an Olympic boxer who I've trained since day one. And I didn't, I wasn't there when Kurt Angle trained, but I was there when Matt Riddle trained and he kind of gives me those vibes. He's just a natural. He loves wrestling and he's an athlete. You put those two together and you know you're gonna make magic camarado another one you know he was in nxt they mm. let him go because they're stupid and they they didn't know what they had which they never do anyway so their loss is our gain and then you have aaron solo another guy who's you know been traveling all over the world for the past 10 years and you know i i kind of i talked to them and we spoke and they realized okay hey we're willing to do this let's make it happen so uh, you know, Wednesday is a huge night. Uh, I was just saying on another interview, I'm toying with the idea of leaving the factory, though, backstage because I want to do this on my own. I want to show that I can hang in the ring with Cody Rhodes. And I don't want there to be any doubt after this match is over. Well, I'm sure there there won't be. But so the only thing I can really compare anything to is is stuff that happens at impact. Right. Like sure. I'm in the same boat, you know, produce and then wrestle and all that kind of stuff. So. I, I'm always curious about how other companies do it. Yeah. So are, are you part of like the creative team? Like do you pitch ideas and stuff or is it strictly like, you know, you got your separate creative team and then they relay it at the, you know, at the, the, the production meeting, like this is how we're going to do things. Like um, it's just, it's weird. You, you mentioned something like, Oh, you know, Keith Mitchell who, you know, worked for sure, Impact sure. prior, he, he was always in the production meetings, yeah. so we wouldn't have to relay the camera shots. So I, I know it's a, done a little bit differently, but the, the creative process, is it like somebody else? And then. No. So you like, guys? you know, you have your EVPs and right now with this, this era that we're in, everything is done through text and everyone has their group chats and there's all different ideas coming from a hundred different directions. And then, you know, at the end of the week or the beginning of the week, I should say, I get with Tony because I'm the one that, you know, with Tony's oversight, I format the show. Right. So okay, like, you do the formats. Okay. Right. So there's sometimes that I just put, you know, uh, Petey Williams segment because I don't know what the full creative is. So then when we go to our production meeting, uh, nine out of 10 times, Tony will explain what it is. But sometimes his, the way he explains it or the, 
it's not fully understandable, right? Because like he'll just and maybe he doesn't want to give so much away either on the because right now we do everything on the phone because it, you know we started in this in this era, the pandemic era, where mm. we couldn't have more than ten people in the room at the hotel. So we just all started doing conference calls and we figured out it's much easier to do it this way. Um, so then the next day when I go to TV, if I show up at noon, which I normally do, uh, it's before everyone else is there and Keith will be there and Greg Warner all from production. And then, you know, they'll pull me aside. Hey, what is this? Hey, what is this? And sometimes I don't know. Sometimes I do know. If I don't know, I call, I make the appropriate, you know, messages and we figure it out. Uh, like I said, that's the one good thing about answering people's messages and creating those relationships with guys like Kenny Omega, where I can text them and say, Hey, what is this? And he'll give me a full description. Whereas someone else might text him and maybe he doesn't respond right away because he knows that if I'm texting him, it's for a specific reason and nine out of 10, well, 10 out of 10 times it's to help him. It's not about me. You know what I mean? So, so that's kind of how we do our things there. Um, that's what I meant when I talk about like bridging that, that gap, because, even if we're on the phone, you might hear something and you still have no clue what it is. And, you know, when I first saw um, Cody was kind of formatting one of the pay-per-views, I was like, oh, man, this would be fun. Like, I want to do this. Yeah. Not realizing every week TV, you know what I mean? Like commercial breaks and this and time. So, uh, but, I, I, you know, it is fun. And like I said, Tony oversees it. So if there's, because I'm not perfect and there's times like I'll oversee something and you know, this segment right next to this segment. It's like, well, these are two of the same things. And it's like, well, again, I don't know the creative. So, you know, had I known that, I probably wouldn't have put two, you know, brawls right next to it. But at the same time, you know what I mean? Like things are going to happen and we're all learning. We're all, unfortunately, some of us are brand new to this kind of stuff. Um, but I think for someone that, like I, like I always say, for someone that never did it before, I'm doing all right. And a lot of it is just one common sense and two asking a lot of questions there's so much knowledge in our in our locker room that i see all the young talent and this is what happened at ring of honor too with bubba i would see all these guys go out and do their match and come backstage and he's just sitting there and i'm like i wasn't wrestling at the time and i'm thinking like man i would love to have you help me with my match because i just watched you do a match and get over you know pop the crowd nine times like hey. nine full times how are you guys and you're getting a this is awesome chant for a move that you almost broke your neck on. Well, he was doing it by looking at the audience. So why aren't you talking to this guy? You know, and it's very much, I don't want to say it's definitely like that at AEW too, but there is just so much knowledge. If you want to have it, you could just ask. And all of these guys, PD, I'm sure you're the same way. Like, you know, you want to give this information out. You know what I mean? Like it doesn't help you to hold it back from these people, especially when you have a backstage gig. Now, if you're just in the ring, shit, yeah, keep your secrets to yourself, get over, make as much. But realistically, even then, you still want to help everybody out because I always said this, unless you're a 35 year old, you know, Italian kid from New Jersey, you know, that's going bald and not in amazing shape. Like, that's the only person I'm not going to help out. You know what I mean? Because that's my spot and yeah. I need that spot. But other than that, like, I have no problem telling, you know, Luchasaurus if he asked me a question, like, those guys. You know, we all need to put on the best product possible because in the end, that's how we're all going to make the most money. And again, this is wrestling, the wrestling business, and we want to make the most money possible. So, uh, so yeah, I don't know if I answered your question. But oh, yeah, just about the creative. That, that makes sense. Yeah. Well, yeah, I want to go back a little bit to what you said about your shenanigans and Ring of Honor. Sure. But I, I want to talk. It's kind of maybe a two part question. Maybe I'll turn out that way. Yeah. But what it sounds like that is there's this, you know, we all start, we all do shit to learn. And then we gain this sense of humility over years. And so it's like after I've been, you know, I've been doing what I've been doing 35 plus years. Right. And it's like when I first came around, I was doing some shit that I wouldn't do today. Yeah. So I guess um, one part of the question is, what was that fuck up that maybe when, what were you had you like had like a, an awakening and sure. is there anybody through throughout your career that you've taken a little bit of a shine to and watched do something similar and pulled them aside and said yo maybe this is there's a different way yeah i mean i'll answer the second question first every single one of my students that comes to tv uh, after tv tony is the greatest boss in the world and he rents out a whole room and there's food for everybody, steaks, I mean, chicken, any, anything that you could think of, he's got there for the town. Cause sometimes we're there till 2 a.m., 3 a.m. Uh, and the restaurants obviously in this era aren't open all the time. 
So, but there's also drinking that goes on. They're socializing, stuff like that. And I firmly believe that unless you're part of that locker room and you have a solidified job, all your, when someone in the locker room sees you, they think of you as someone trying to take their spot. And again, when I was younger, I would think the same thing. So I just always tell them, hey guys, get your food, go up to your hotel room, create, you know, say hi to everybody, but take your food, go, go down the hall, all eat together as a school. Like no one's going to get mad at you for not hanging out with the contracted talent. No one will ever get mad at you for that. They'll get mad if you come in and don't say anything and then you just grab your food and leave and you take Chris Jericho steak. You know what I mean? But like, other than that, like, you know, stay out of trouble. You know, a lot of it is common sense. Uh, with me in Ring of Honor, again, when they offered me my contract and I saw the number that was on there, I looked at Ring of Honor for what it was at the time. Uh, in 2012, it was a stepping stone to get somewhere else. So I wasn't smart enough to keep that in my, in my head. <laughs> I was telling, you know, a couple of people that I was telling my boss that like, okay, well, this obviously isn't a real job. And he's like, oh, that's a real job. Yeah. For you, it's a real job. You're making real money. For me, we're working three shows a month and I'm making a hundred dollars a match. That doesn't pay my car payment. Like where, where, and I understand you got to start somewhere to, to move up and I get all of that. But at the time when I'm seeing the money, that Sinclair Broadcasting has and all of this, and you're not paying affordable wages. Now, look what happened. They tried to do the same thing until Cody and the Bucks showed up. And then they started paying, now they're paying ridiculous money to guys that, you know, probably aren't worth that. You know what I mean? Whether they are or not, I don't know. But I look at some of their talent and I think like, man, like these guys are doing pretty well for them. So they should really call Cody and the Bucks and thank them because they're getting these nice full-time contracts where again, a lot of it is me being bitter about it, but man, I was 26 years old. And within the first three months at Ring of Honor, I broke my neck, broke my nose. You know, it was, it wasn't good. And I wasn't enjoying wrestling. So I couldn't wait for my con. I mean, I asked for my contract to get released from my contract a month early. And they told me, no, I was like, why would you say no? I'm literally doing nothing for you guys. I'm out there, you know, doing three minute TV matches because that's all I wanted to do was just be seen on TV at the time. Because I figured at least if my face was on TV, that gives me some credibility to hopefully, you know, move on and upward. Uh, I didn't take Ring of Honor for what it was, which I did and I didn't, right? Like I could have used it the right way and performed better than everyone on the roster or tried to at least, right? And then that would have opened the eyes of the other promotions and stuff like that. So that's where I messed up. Uh, I don't regret it one bit. I really don't. Because even before AEW started, I opened a school and I had a chip on my shoulder when I wasn't offered a job as a, not a job, a tryout as a coach down in developmental at NXT. I had this chip on my shoulder. Well, I'm just going to open my own school then. I'm going to open my own school and I'm going to make it the greatest school in the world. And it's going to be better than the performance center. And it, so I've kind of like made it my mission to do that. So that's why if you see our student showcase, it's got lights, everything. I mean, I want it to be the greatest show in the world for these kids that, you know, pay their money to, to learn from us. I think, I think it's awesome, too, because, you know, just last night I was watching one of the Nightmare Factory, you know, matches you showing yeah. the different kids. What I think, I guess, is there a different advice because you also, too, because you're you're as passionate about the coaching and, and doing it right that that QT Marshall, the performer and QT Marshall, the coach to separate the two different, but like with the young kids coming up, like what is the most important? Is it the basics fundamentals or what is the basics for, for QT Marshall and the wrestling that you teach the kids out of the gate? Yeah. So fundamentals, definitely right. Your foundation. Uh, you wouldn't be able to tell by looking at me, but I remember a couple of weeks ago, Excalibur was on dark talking about, you know, Anthony Agoga was putting me over this before this whole thing started and he was like, that guy could do anything. And Excalibur was like, yeah, I'd love to see his Phoenix Splash. So I went to the school and did a Phoenix Splash. Like, <laughs> fucking, I'm an athlete. Like, screw you. You know what I mean? Now, that doesn't mean I want to do it on a dark match. No. You know what I mean? And knock my, you know, because one, I would feel terrible, terrible asking someone to lay there for me to hit them with a Phoenix Splash. You know what I mean? Like, I know that's going to just, you know, give them. Yeah, didn't you hit the dummy you know or something? I mean? Like, and yeah. I don't want to miss one of those. You know, so, um, but like, those are the things that I think as a trained professional wrestler, 
you have your back bumps, your face bumps, you know, like it's all the same stuff. You just, it's where you put it. And it's, it's, that's what really matters. And I know that sounds like a real old school thing, but it's true. And the guys that can't or choose not to, uh, to do those crazy things, they, and the ones that are over, like they prove it just by having people invest in them. So I always try to tell everybody, you know, right now, when you're learning your fundamentals, be the, the default baby face, right? So like today we were talking about at the school, try not to back up, you know, just always move forward, make the heel back up. And they're like, well, what happens if, yes, there are, you know, exceptions, but if you just, I can't root for you if you're begging off like a, like a pussy, I can't root for you. And that's what I was telling everyone about my baby face work. I always used to get in arguments with guys about certain things like, hey, let me do this to cut you off. Like, no, I can't do that. Well, what do you mean? Well, it makes me look stupid. Yeah, who cares? I care because people already don't like me. So like now I can't look stupid on top of it. You know what I mean? Like if I'm a heel, let me look stupid all the time. I don't care. You know, so there are certain things that I really try to instill in them. And then it all goes down to the same thing I tell them to. But if you're over, do whatever the hell you want. But you got to get over and part of getting over is to keep the fans, uh, keep them into your magic, right? Like don't let them take themselves out of it. And they will if you mess up, if you do something that doesn't logically make sense. Once you get to that other level, do whatever the hell you want. And, you know, thank me for having a great foundation. The one thing I learned about the wrestling business is when you do something great and you feel like you come out with a high five, you get a lot of heat. And it's the weird for us, I guess I want to say civilians, when we look in inwards into your industry, we go, why would people be mad at you for that? And in 2017, you had this amazing documentary that won awards all over. And if people have not seen it, go out and watch it because it is phenomenal. But did you get any backlash when you thought you put out something amazing and a great product? Then somewhere in the wrestling industry, people are like, "Uh, uh-uh, uh, that's that's no go." And you're like, "What?" Um, you talk about the documentary and exactly yeah. like specifically. So that was a buddy I went to. Uh, I used to live in Orlando. I used to go to the gym with this kid Nick, his brother Frank, who directed it. He just wanted to do a documentary on wrestling. And one thing led to another. I told him he could follow me as long as it didn't mess with my normal life. Like, just don't bother me. You could film whatever you want. Like please just don't make this a hassle for me because I'm a nobody. And I remember telling him these things, like I'm a nobody. He's like, yeah, but I think that's the best part and blah, blah, blah. And then I went to like do extra work at the time, which we didn't cover because they couldn't go there. And then the WWE offered me the tryout at the extra work. So then he was like, oh, this is great. What a story, blah, blah, blah. And then they pulled the tryout and it was like, oh, this is great. I remember him telling me, this is amazing. Like what a good story. And I'm thinking like, well, like I want to fucking, you know, like, burn my real life right now. Like, yeah, like, hey, man, this isn't cool. Like, there's no alternative, you know? And he was like, no, this will be the greatest thing that ever happens to you. You'll see. And I was like, yeah, whatever. So then he started shopping it around. And like I said, we went to Comic-Con. It won the award. I couldn't believe it. Um, And then Cody saw it. We he wanted to screen it in Atlanta. And I was like, I was training Brandy at the time. And my wife was like, hey, did you invite Brandy and Cody? And I was like, hell no, I'm not inviting them. Like, this is embarrassing. You know what I mean? Like, to me, it was because it's sh- it really showed my my true life. You know what I mean? I couldn't put on anymore. Yeah. You know, it was it was real. And so Brandy, I, I did invite them. And then as Cody will say, like he didn't want to go. The same reason, like I didn't want him there. He didn't want to go there because he knew it was going to be surrounded with a bunch of indie wrestlers. And you know, he probably didn't want to be bothered. And this, but anyway, they showed up. They watched this movie, and Cody said it. He tells me I worked them. He goes, and I can't believe it. I fell for it hook, line and sinker. He thinks the whole movie is just like a sham. And it was just an idea that we had to get a job in wrestling, which couldn't be further from the truth. Uh, If it were, man, I'm a fucking real smart guy. You know what I mean? Which I'm not like this kid just had a vision. He wanted to do it. He was a film student from Full Sail. And uh, so Cody saw it. And like, that's what led to him wanting to hire me that, you know, it was that then me being around him more. And then going all in as a guest. And then, you know, the producer that was supposed to produce the show kind of got in a little bit of trouble. So they asked me to jump in. And somehow I was able to produce the first half of the show on the headset by strictly guessing and checking. 
oh, does this button talk to the truck? Does this one talk to the ref? Okay. And I didn't say anything to anyone. And I waited for Cody to be done with his match. He came in the back. He's like, I'll take it from here. Just, just drenched in sweat. Thank God, you know? And uh, I remember him saying, uh, you know, he told me, he said it right to his agent at the time, like that kid ain't going anywhere. Like he's wherever we go, he's coming. I thought he'd go back to WWE. I'd never see him again. Cause I had no idea there was going to be an AEW. I didn't know until the day of the rally, you know what I mean? So the Jacksonville rally like that, I was even thought of because he texted me that morning. He was like, hey, can you make it to Jacksonville? I was like, well, it's the first day of our beginner class that I have six people signed up for at $1,500 a pop. Like, it's good money. I don't want to miss out on this, you know? I'm finally doing something with the school. And he was like, well, I'll pay you $500. I was like, all right, I'll be there. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and the students loved it. They're like, oh, that's great. You're going to the rally. And I'm thinking like, man, your first day of school, your coach isn't there. Man, I would ask for my money back. But, you know, of course, they don't look at it that way. Yeah. So. Uh, so yeah, it worked out. That documentary was, it actually did turn into be the greatest thing that ever happened to me in my career. So I'm glad I did it. I'm glad I was uh, honest with everybody in there because I think, and I'm glad my mom really hated the idea of me being a pro wrestler because that one scene with her and my wife in the, in the dining room where she's just like, you know, you're, he always, so Cody always plays the trailer, always <laughs> it's on YouTube. And he always plays it because my mom says like, you know, first you were 20 and now you're 30 and pretty soon you'll be 40. Like, when are you going to give it up? You know? Yeah. And uh, so he loves it. He thinks it's the greatest thing ever, especially because now that he knows who my mom is and my wife, who my wife is the greatest human being in the world. But in that, in that one moment, she grew a huge set of balls to, to jump in with my mom and just berate me about that. I should just give up. And, you know, of course I never did, which, thank God, uh, you know, and she says, oh, and then what, we're just going to move to Atlanta, like out of nowhere. And then literally a year later, that's exactly what we did. I just told her, hey, I'm quitting my job. We're going to move to Atlanta. I'm going to open a wrestling school and we'll see how it goes. And she was like, okay, well, we can do it. I was like, all right, let's do it. So yeah, so, nuts, you know. So but, you'll see, you'll see how it goes. And so I want to talk about sure. you know, future goals. All yeah. right. So uh, this may be weird, but it, it was weird to me because, you know, talking with, and I don't know if you talked to Tony or whatever, but I was, I'll preface it with this. I was talking to the more not too long ago and it was really weird. Nobody's really asked me about my goals at this point in pro wrestling. Like, Hey, sure. what are your goals with this company? Yeah. And I told him a, B and C. And he said, you know, why are you shooting so low? Why isn't it here? So do you already, you love what you're doing. I love what I'm doing. You know, yeah. you're doing the producing, you're, you're wrestling the whole, the whole nine and you're having fun right now, but have you thought about like, Hey, what's the next step for me? What's, what's, what's my future goals? Yeah, sure. I mean, in the ring, obviously I want to be as good as I can be. I yeah. just genuinely, uh, you know, we joke about like, Oh, well, this whole thing is about respect and you know, blah, blah, blah. That's true. Um, it is, it's about respect. It's about going down in the history of wrestling as somebody that helped for the better. Um, and I don't mean that in like a 2021 way. I mean it in like a genuine, like I want people to know like, man, that QT guy, he did a lot of stuff and he never said no. And he, he worked his, his ass off and, and um, in the ring, I've always loved obviously, right? Since I'm little, since I'm eight years old. So the one thing I've always wanted to do. And so I trained really hard for that. So like, Yes, I wish I could be world champion, of course. Like that would be the ultimate, the ultimate goal. Headline a pay-per-view and win the world title. Um, mm -hmm. There's a lot of stuff that I probably need to do to make to make those goals happen that sometimes, you know, the other job does interfere with or, and it, those are excuses as well. But like, for the most part, like I always say to all the students, like you don't need a six pack. Like if you're, you know, if your character matches what you look like and all this stuff, which is it, pretty true, but- yeah it's never going to hurt you to have a six pack. You know what I mean? Mm. But I enjoy Reese's, you know? So like I enjoy ice cream. I enjoy enjoying my life. So, so there are certain things that I know will take me to the next level. Um, and I'm, I am trying my hardest at those things um, behind the scenes. You know, I don't, I don't ever want to stop. Like if there's something attainable, I want it, you know, at the, in 10 years from now, I hope it's, you know, myself and Tony you know, and Cody's off in Hollywood or doing what he's doing and the Bucks and Kenny are doing whatever they're doing. And I'm still there. Like I told Tony the other day, I just got, when I got promoted to this director of uh, creative, you know, coordination, I, I told him like, Hey, he was like, Hey, congrats. Yeah. Yeah. And I just told him like, Hey, uh, 
like I'll sign a contract for the next hundred years. Like I, as long as the pay continues to go up, like I don't, right. I never want to leave. I don't want to go anywhere. This is what I love. Um, I love the passion that Tony has for this, for this industry, especially somebody, I always look at that, right? Somebody that doesn't need the financial gain, right? Students too, like Jade Cargill. She's, she doesn't need the money and she's there, beautiful woman, busting her ass, every, getting kicked in the face and all this stuff. She doesn't need the money, so she must love it. You know what I mean? Or she must have the passion for it. So when I see someone like Tony, like that's a guy that I'm like, you know what? Like, I will believe, it's kind of like they always just say about Paul, uh, you know, Paul Heyman, like I'll believe what he's selling me because he doesn't need it. So if he's telling me that this is why he's doing this, like I believe that because he has no reason to try to carny me into believing anything else. So yeah, I mean, my goals, of course, like I said, it, it's to, you know, be as the top of the top, you know, in both aspects. Um, are they attainable? Who knows, right? Just got to keep working hard. And listen, I never thought I would be behind the scenes. I never thought I would be where I'm at ever. And on camera, you know, once 2015 happened, I never thought I'd be wrestling on TV. So, uh, you know, that's why I'm gung ho on doing whatever I have to do to succeed, you know, so. Yeah, you know, I, I, throughout this time that you've been talking, I've been thinking about like what great wrestlers and great musicians have in common, and even great athletes, is they have a great imagination, right? And they always got to draw from someplace. Sure. So, you know, and not everybody who's a musician can produce, just like not everybody who's a wrestler can produce a TV show or produce a wrestling match. It takes a, a certain thing, maybe it's an extra added imagination. I'm curious how you differentiate the two because it's two different roles because I've produced records and it's like just because I'm a musician, I've made records doesn't mean that, that I'm going to be a great producer. Right. So do you do you put yourself in a certain mindset um, before going into the producing gig? And is it a different mindset than the wrestling gig? It is. I mean, uh, when it comes to the producing side, you know, a lot of it is like, if we're talking about matches, for instance, you have a, a right away, right? There's that immediate response from the audience. And even if it's our audience of wrestlers that are sitting ringside, we're the biggest fans of all. So, you know, when you get a fan or you get someone reacting to what you're doing. So I think that's the best part about when you're producing a match is you get that, that right away, that response. Um, when you're producing the whole show, you know, obviously there's social media and we do have people that sit on there all night and they're looking at that stuff and seeing what's taken off and what's, you know, people are really into. And a lot of it is just before we're wrestlers, before we're producers, before we're anything, we were wrestling fans. And we feel that if we would enjoy it, most fans would enjoy it. And I'm not talking about the ones that want to complain on Twitter that don't enjoy it because Honestly, I have a great friend. He texts me every week, every single week. He's texting me about how bad Raw is, how bad SmackDown is, how bad NXT, sometimes how what he doesn't like about AEW. And I'm thinking like, buddy, I'm sitting next to the owner right now. Like, I'm not going to open this text message. And on top of that, why are you still watching? And then I realized, oh, because he's a wrestling fan. He's like myself. I watch every type of wrestling, good, bad, doesn't matter. I love wrestling. I would much rather watch a terrible independent match between two guys that aren't trained, then I would watch, you know, a, a rerun of, of friends. You know what I mean? So when we're putting a show together and all this stuff that's going into it, we think like, Hey, would this, would this be cool to see? Would it be cool to see Cody Rhodes and QT fighting on top of the nightmare <laughs> express? Uh, yeah. you know, plus? And I'm like, yeah, that would be great. Like, you know, it's ridiculous. And you know, I don't, I don't want you to can knock me off because I remember what happened with Mike Awesome and the guy from ICP. You know, I don't want that to happen in WCW, you know, and it's like, but you know what, at the end of the day, like, if we can make that happen, you know, like, that's going to be a moment that people remember for a long time. And that's what I want, right? Like, I want people to remember the stuff that I do. Um, so there's that aspect. And like you said, yeah, it's very hard to, some guys can't produce, and they can wrestle some guys you know, can't wrestle, but they can produce. And, but I think overall, if, if, as long as you understand one human psychology and two, the idea of what pro wrestling is, as long as you understand that. And if you don't, we have coaches there to help 
And like I said, I've been very fortunate to ask the right questions at the right times. And uh, so, yeah, so I, that was, I think I answered. I don't know if there was another part to that that I didn't hit, but I'm a space cadet sometimes, you know. No uh, worries, bro. No worries. Hey, my question is, so who yeah. were you, as a wrestling fan, who who are some of your, growing up, some of your favorite wrestlers, or who's, who are some of the favorite matches, wrestlers that you watch now? So there's a big thing going on right now. And when I say it's big, it's the same 10 people that I talk about on Twitter. Uh, they all say I punch like The Rock, which is true. But I also punch like Razor Ramon, because that's yeah. the guy that- I, I see more Razor Ramon. Yeah, that's what made me fall in love with wrestling was Razor Ramon and oozing machismo, which, you know, I remember my mom wouldn't let me get that shirt because she didn't like the oozing machismo part. And I was just like, no, I'm just, you know, he's macho, you know, and she's like, that's not what he means, you know, and I'm thinking like, all right, whatever. Uh, so, so he was definitely someone. And then when I was in Florida, he had, when he went back to TNA or went to TNA in 2010, he was kind of helping out at the place I was training at. So I really got to like talk to him and, you know, learn certain things. So uh, it was, yeah, exactly. So he, him, uh, Shawn Michaels, uh, definitely was somebody that, you know, like I idolized when I was 11 years old, 12 years old. I mean, I remember when my dad was supposed to take me to meet him at a, a, a car dealership and he was late because, you know, he's my dad. And uh, so I got like a, a black and white Xerox copy of his autograph. And I remember 12 years old, like crying in the, and calling my mom on his phone just like ripping him apart, you know, cause they're divorced. It was like, dad was late and blah, blah, blah. You know, he's the worst dad ever. And I didn't get to meet him. So my mom made him take me to the Meadowlands that might, uh, that night and uh, buy a ticket. So we got to watch the live event that it was like Shawn Michaels versus Vader or something. I remember my dad telling me afterwards, like, wow, now I see why you like this guy so much. Like the athleticism, the girls going crazy for him. I'm like, yeah, come on, dad. You know, he probably just, so anyway, there was him. And then of course, I mean, the rock, you know, just incredible. Like I remember then being a teenager, just like being just drawn into everything that was going on. And be, from being from New Jersey, I wasn't a WCW guy. Of course I go back now and we watch stuff and I think like, Oh man, this is like really good wrestling, you know, but I look for guys that or matches that make you feel a certain way. If they make you feel a certain way, like there's students all the time and I'm going to go on a little bit of a tangent, but they tell me, you know, I really want this. And I say, okay. And I know they like video games and I'm not a big video gamer. Not that there's anything wrong with being a gamer. I'm just not that guy. And I'll say like, what's your favorite video game? Oh, Final Fantasy. Okay. Well, how many levels are in front? And they'll tell me like the whole game from start to finish. And then I'm like, what's your favorite wrestling match? They're like, oh, and they give you the answer that like, they think you want to hear, you know, like Mysterio versus Guerrero. And I'm like, which one? They're like, Halloween Havoc. I'm like, okay, what was the finish? Uh... Uh, and I'm like, you don't know the finish? Like, that wasn't even one of my favorite matches. And I remember the fucking going for the razor's edge, flipping to the hurricane. Like, yeah. these are things that if this is what you love, you should know these things if it's your favorite match. So I'm just a, you know, again, I look at the matches that made me feel a certain way and they make me remember like how I felt. And usually I, I find myself watching those over and over and over again, and then picking them apart and trying to see like, okay, what could I do here? How can I try to get this, you know, reaction? And of course, you know, uh, I think my biggest detriment in wrestling is what I was explaining today to my mom of all people, because uh, she just she doesn't like reading the comments about me. You know, she's a, she, you know, she's. I mean, someone even screenshotted one of her things on Facebook. Like, I was like, Ma, you gotta stop. Like, I'm a, I'm a heel. It's okay. No, they're saying you don't deserve to be there. I'm like, it's okay. Like, don't worry about it. You know, and. Uh, but I told her, I said, the problem is I wrestle like I'm already, you know, a superstar, like I'm over because I don't do the, the indie tricks that I used to do because, I, and it's a detriment too, but like, I mean, it's very easy to just say, shut up to the audience, you know what I mean? And then they boo. So I try to work like I tell my students to want to work and sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, but you know, I'm having fun. That's all, that's all that really matters at the end of the day. There you go. We got you paid. And you're getting paid. And I'm getting paid, right, yeah. Well, you know, I always say I would do it for free, but not anymore. <laughs> no way. That's because you're 35, not 26. That's right. Exactly. Too many bills.
we got time for one question a piece and for yeah. his mom out there he's made fans of all of us so we love him already here on the podcast so if she's watching hi mom yeah i'm gonna make sure she watches just so she understands because it's it's been rough man i will let me let me have my final question be like touch on the nightmare factory which we've talked about a little bit here and there but what is the relationship between aew and the factory itself so i always say this uh nothing <laughs> my job they have asked me now with this new title part of it is like for instance anthony ogogo they brought him here they got him his visa he came over to train on the house you know like they paid him i never asked for anything because I, I don't think, what am I going to charge them? Five grand? That's what I charge. You know, 4,500. Is that what I'm going to ask AEW for? Or do I wait and then show what he can do? Uh, also, you know, these other people that come out there and this, that. And then I ask for the big chunk of change. You know, I've always been a believer in don't pick up the, the dollars or the pennies when the million is just sitting you just got to go really far to get it, but it's there. But if you spend the time picking up all that loose change, you'll never get there. So I've done a lot of stuff um, without, you know, asking for anything. So to answer your question, we don't have any type of relationship except for the fact that Cody runs a camp out of there. And that part of my job is if they ask me to train anybody, I will do it. But, you know, until we sign something, which, I don't think we need to. I mean, it's kind of understood. Um, and honestly, I enjoy it. I, I love that it's mine. And I love the fact that I can, you know, go to production and look at what they, you know, they rent out. Because when we filmed Dynamite there last year, you know, that was during the pandemic, we filmed it a whole month worth of tapings in like two or three days. Mm. And I saw what could be created there. And I was like, oh my God, like, this is what I want. This is what I would love for these guys to be able to do. So now it's to the point where we got these things with the, like wood with wheels and they could just lift the ring up, put it on top. They slide all the other rings away. I mean, the setup for their showcase takes about 45 minutes, you know, and they have a full production, full studio setup, commentary, you know, lights, the whole deal. And again, when I first, my first match was in front of 36 people, no microphone, uh, in a paintball, you know, arena. So we were slipping on the way to the ring and, um, you know, we called it in the ring and these guys, some of their first matches on the first showcase has 175,000 views. You know what I mean? So we're setting people up for success. And so that's the best part about it. Uh, like I said, we've spoken a little bit, but we don't go into too much about the school just because, you know, again, I think it's one of those things, like I would love to produce multiple talents and, really prove a value because then i feel like you don't get under undercut you know <laughs> you make more money <laughs> so absolutely um so let's talk about uh you know the this forbidden door okay sure. obviously you know AEW seems like they're the cornerstone between everything that's going on with like new japan and and impact and all that kind of stuff so at the tapings like every single taping pay-per-view i see tony there all the time right yeah. Um, so, and I mean, you're probably not going to answer this question. I, I okay. guess it's more selfish for me, but no, like, it's okay. can, can I expect to, to, to see you there with Tony? I mean, I see so, Jerry there all the time, Shivani, um, yeah, all mean, that kind of stuff. Jerry lives, you know, he lives in, in Nashville. Nashville. Yeah. Uh, Tony, I think likes, you know, obviously he grew up watching Shivani. So they become like great friends. And of course, Shivani came back to wrestling for AEW. So they have a little bit of a different relationship. I would go in a heartbeat. I, you know, it's four hours for me. I've never been invited. So I don't think I'm- Come on, there. man. Yeah. Come on. I'm inviting I mean, you. I talked about it once. Like, I remember telling Cody, like, well, if I can't wrestle here, like I'll wrestle wherever. Like, I just want to wrestle, man. Like, you know, and uh, we spoke about it. You know, like I said, if it's something that, I feel uh, I can do and he needs it or whatever, but I try to, I try to stay out of those things because like we see, so like I went into Tony's office one day and Scott Demore was in there and it was like, oh, and I started to walk out like, no, no, hang out, you know? And I'm like, okay. And it's just, I don't know what's going on because that's through Kenny and Tony and it's not my business. So like, again, it's just one of those things like, Hey, uh, you know, but just make sure you put in the format that the good brothers have an interest. And I'm thinking like good brothers, like, okay. Like, you know, I'm not even going to ask because it's not worth it to me. Like at the end of the day, you know, if the, again, 
I'm, I don't look like, well, kind of, I used to look like Carl Anderson a little bit, but like, I'm not Luke Gallows. I'm not Carl Anderson. They're not taking my spot. So at the end of the day, it doesn't matter to me. As long as everyone's happy, I think Tony is getting a chance to, to be an on-screen character in Impact, which is incredible. Cause like, of course he wanted to be an owner and stuff, but everyone wants a little bit of, of everything, you know? And if you can have it, why not? You know, so I'm all for it. Like I've been at our arena till, you know, sometimes 2.33 a.m. while he's filming these paid advertisements with Tony Schiavone, you know? And I'm thinking like, this guy's loving life right now. Like, this is what I want, you know? So uh, maybe I'll come by, you know, like I said, it's only a couple hours away. I think they take the private jet and I'm petrified of going on the private jet. So uh, yeah, I just, I don't even like commercial planes. So I can only imagine them real small ones with, uh, you know, I'll be white knuckled the whole time. But if I can drive there and, and I'm invited, you know, I'll talk to Tony this week about it. I'm sure he'll have no problem with me going, you know, awesome. as long as, uh, you know, um, creatively everything works out, right? That's the big thing, right? It has to be good creatively for everybody, you know? So, you know, awesome. I, I can kind of see a match already starting to happen, like um, producer versus producer. Oh, here we yeah, go. right. Here we go. Hey, and, and actually, uh, AEW helped me take my first. Canadian destroyers. I took one from Pentagon and then I took one from, uh, I did a real cool one with Marco stunt, which didn't look as great as I wanted it to, but I had him <laughs> like a, a power bomb and then oh, I and then pop them up, up and, and then into and, so you've done that one. I'm sure. Right? No, I just do the oh. basic one, but okay. I've seen all of them. I get tagged in like, of uh, course, of course. Yeah. So, I mean, I've seen them all. Yeah. Well, I was like, I'm going to do this. And I remember a big show you know, or sorry, Paul White pulling me aside. He was like, the hell are you doing? <laughs> I was like, <laughs> man, you know, I'm wrestling Marco, dude. Like, I like this guy, you know? And he's like, yeah, but you know, think about your trajectory. And I'm thinking like, man, I don't care right yeah. now. Like, let's have some fun, man. He's, you know, he's Marco, you know, and it's one move, you know, he finally took me down. It's okay. You know, big bumps. So, yeah. Yeah. Sometimes wrestling logic, you know, it is what it is. As much as I preach it, like, again, I also, I'm trying to earn respect with some of those guys too. You know, I don't want to, it's hard enough when I got to tell them what, what's going on. And then on top of that, man, I got to be real protective of, of my stuff. You know, I'm not into that. Yeah. So there's a lot of guys like that. I'm not one of them, you know? Well, I want to keep my last question kind of fun and I want to uh, channel, um, come on, sorry, come on. Um, I want to channel Dimitri Young a little bit because sure. his kind of questions are, are always, I think, the funnest. And so as a wrestler, you can pick anybody that you would want to wrestle. Oof. Okay. Who is it going to be? Who are the two guys calling the match? Mm. And what's the finish? Okay. Oof. So, man, that's hard. I mean, I I mean, it, I, listen, I get this stupid question all the time. Like, what's sure. your favorite song? Yeah, Who's of course, of course. Favorite? And I know this is the wrestling version of it. Yeah. But I'm not, I'm not gonna hate on myself right now. So it would it would have to be um, you know, we have full crowds, right? There's full oh, full yeah. audience. Okay. So we're at a sold out arena. It would have to be the rock, I think, because I think, uh, man, that's hard. So I want to say Shawn Michaels too, because he'll sell my shit, you know? <laughs> He's really going to put me over. Uh, but The Rock is just going to have those three way. So, yeah, we can do a three way, right? I, I would say this too. Or, I mean, or uh, Shawn Michaels can be the special guest referee. He does have a. Uh, I don't know. The last time he was a special referee for The Rock, you know, he really screwed him. So that'll help me. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, no, I would, I, would say, I would say The Rock. That would be my dream match. Um, I don't know how good it would be on my end, but that would be my dream one. And I would, I would say, of course, the voice of my childhood would have to be Jim Ross and, Bang. you know, I mean, those were the guys and every week I get JR to call my stuff now. And, you know, six months into the company, he didn't even know I was a wrestler. So <laughs> it's pretty exciting. <laughs> and, you know, he calls the stuff and what was the, oh, and who's up, you know, it would finish. It would, yeah. It would be me. You know, he'd have to he'd have to do the favors because I've spent way too much money on his sneakers. You know, <laughs> so he's got to he owes me a little bit, you know, every pair at one hundred and forty dollars a pair, you know, but they are comfortable. So awesome. I love it. 
Uh, my uh, last question is actually on the uh, who who in the nightmare factory that or that you train and some up and comers any any names to look out for or, or stuff that the guys that you're seeing because obviously you know as as I look at you as as two different people right sure. the wrestler guy but also too as as and you've explained it but it's sort of like what Dusty Rhodes and now you within with Cody, but it's sort of that vortex of the storytelling, but the wrestlers wrestlers. So are there some up and coming guys that, or, or guys in the back like the QT Marshalls that haven't got their shot yet that, you know, um, yeah, I mean, there, so we just finished the camp and we did the showcase yesterday for it. And actually the guy that won the main event of the showcase, Dylan, who trained originally with Dr. Tom and Kane. And then we kind of, you know, we got him in the best shape of his life. And, and so I wrestled him, it aired tonight on elevation and cause he's Cody's prize student, you know, Oh, Dylan, Dylan McQueen is going to be the, this star, like gorgeous George. And then we gave him a huge entrance and all this bullshit. So uh, <laughs> he, he's, good. he's very good at what he does. He travels all over the place. He's always got his name out there. OVW this, that, and the other. And, uh, so we brought him to TV and today we, tonight we wrestled and uh, you know, I won. <laughs> I beat the shit out of him. He was bleeding by the end of it. So, but he is someone to look out for uh, just not against me at this moment, you know? No, um, no. I, I love, I love it. Old school. Plus, yeah. You, you know, know it's like initiation. You know? Yeah, it's exactly. like right of passage, man. Trust right, me. Right. I got, you know? I got so, stuffed in a, in a uh, bus bathroom. So I mean, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, there, there's him. There's a couple females um, that we have because, uh, of course, you know, we are a very uh, friendly environment and we really, you know, my wife works there as well. So, like, we really try to give them the same opportunities. And, um, and of course, with the female talent in the world, there's just more men than there are women. So female talent is a little bit easier to get opportunities, I would say. I, I don't mean that in a negative way. Like, there's just more spots open. Um, especially for, you know, professionally trained athletes and that have nice gear and this, that, and the other. So with the great foundation, so that we have a couple of them, uh, one of them will actually, uh, probably be on dynamite pretty soon. Um, so yeah, I mean, we just, there's a lot that aren't being showcased yet because that's where Cody and I differ. He's all about sending them out there, letting them learn as they go. And I'm the complete opposite. And maybe it's because when Cody started, he started on third base. They threw him right out there. He was Dusty's kid, put him in OVW. While he was in OVW getting paid to learn how to wrestle, I was already in my second year of paying to learn how to wrestle. So we have different philosophies in that aspect. Uh, so there are some guys and girls that, that are there that are barely getting their feet wet in AEW dark, stuff like that. Cause you know, of course with 30 matches in two days, you know, we need as many local talents as possible. And like I said, you know, uh, Atlanta is local to Jacksonville. So uh, we have one, another guy, Brick. His name is Brick Aldrich. He's been on Dark a couple of times. He looks like a little Scott Norton, though. And, I mean, he was Rick Steiner's son's strength coach at college. And he used to come with Rick Steiner's son to the school without Rick knowing because his son was still playing college ball. And then his son got drafted. And then when he got cut by the Ravens, he came back with Brick. And then, of course, he got signed to NXT and Brick is, you know, Brick's just the strength coach. But Brick looks like a million bucks and he understands wrestling and he enjoys it. So he's someone that I really try to look out for because he invested in us and he looks great. He's an athlete. You know, he's like 5'11", six, or 5'11", six foot, maybe 235, 240, uh, sometimes 250. You know, he's got a wrestling singlet. He was a college wrestler. So he's somebody that I really look at as, okay, this guy, if he sticks with it, if he just trusts the process, like, unfortunately, he's my student, he wasn't Cody's student. So he gets the, you know, uh, the stepchild treatment, you know what I mean? So it's like, and I can only do so much. And, uh, but I've, so I've spoken to Tony about him a couple of times. So it's just a matter of, you know, right place at the right time. You know, we have a humongous roster right now. Um, we have so little real estate. You know, like I said, I'm so fortunate to, to even be getting this opportunity. But again, I know the opportunity that I have is because of the three guys that I'm with as well. You know, if I was not in a faction, if this was just me, 
I'd be doing what I was doing, you know, six months ago, which was jumping off a ladder once every, you know, eight months on dynamite. Yeah. So, or, you know, getting the match with the Lance archers that lead to the next storyline or Brody Lee's debut, you know, which I'm very fortunate to be able to say that I was the guy that Tony Khan had asked to, to, to have that match because it was live TV and it was the second week of no audience. So, um, so yeah, I, I, you know, I hope I answered that the right way, but absolutely. Yeah. For everybody at home, the show's over. We'll say our goodbyes off the air. QT, where can people find you if they're interested in the Nightmare Factory? Throw it all out there. Sure. Uh, it's NF underscore training on Twitter. Uh, I think it's Nightmare Factory training at gmail.com or NF train. I don't know. I'm not really good at this. My well, wife handles all of it. Uh, but you, you'll find us if you just look it up. Um, on Twitter, I'm real M Marshall one, uh, Marshall one, but Marshall one. Um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be following me right now because I'm going back and forth with the audience. Uh, I don't, I genuinely dislike the audience telling us how to perform and how to do our jobs. I don't like it. I think that we've given them. Sorry, I'm gonna one more time. Do it. Stay. As uh, as you want. I've, I've given. We've given them too much power, and I challenge any single fan that like right now the big thing is like i said that qt is boring qt we change the channel you don't change the channel seven of you might but another forty thousand come back so i challenge anybody that wants to talk shit to any other performers uh about the way they do their jobs come to the factory and fight me and i'm okay saying it come to the factory we have we have uh you know uh, waivers so you don't sue us and take the money that i've earned and you, just, you know you just get in the ring like just, i don't mind it i was trained by bubba he used to call fans over the rails to fight yeah, him yeah. and it's not because he was trying to get he was like go ahead fight me i will now i'm not saying i'm, I'm going to get like some six foot five guy showing up to fuck, kick my ass but you know the other guys will be there Comrade will be there a gogo will be there so we'll be okay but genuinely like I so right now I'm just on this kick of going back and forth with them. You know, when they spell stuff wrong, when they say stupid things, you know, I just tell them, hey, come fight me. Like, I'm not gonna argue with you on Twitter, just come fight me. You know, you just, it is you what just it is. became my favorite fucking wrestler of all time. Oh, yeah. well, my mean, Twitter. So this just, whole past you know, just the whole past fucking two fucking years, I, as a company guy, I've been so nice and watching people like tell me I don't deserve this and I don't deserve fuck you. Like, you don't deserve to be talking to me. Like the fact that you're talking to me, like you should just be happy that I'm even acknowledging you and then I have to put them in their place. You know? uh, My wife hates it right now because I'm always on Twitter, but it's because there's so much hate and it's like, well, I have to put these people. She's like, you don't have to put everyone in their place. Like, no, I don't. But the ones that are grammatically incorrect or that spell things wrong, like they need to know how dumb they are, you know? So, well, no one, uh, no one, no one uh, has put the statue to a critic, you know what I mean? Right, exactly, exactly. Lawrence, what was that thing you said about Marshall on a couple podcasts about how you didn't like him? I said I was coming to the fucking factory to beat his ass. Oh, shit. Yeah, well, uh, <laughs> I hope you can beat up a go-go because the one thing I won't do is fight. <laughs> no, bro, I mean, you, you twist me up and toss me out. I, I'm, I'm just playing. But, um, no, it's been awesome to get to know you, man. It's it's great to see you, that you know how real you are, and uh, sure. super cool to have you on this show. I'm super Thank stoked. I, I, was appreciate it. I was able to be a part of it. No, yeah, well, I'm talking to you. Absolutely, big fan and uh, yeah. big fan of the direction of where, like, what you're doing at AEW because it looks everybody's all in for the best show possible and all the storylines, no matter what it is. And it's so, like you said, it makes sense because you guys, it's not only opening up, you know, the third curtain or the wall or whatever, but it's the common sense, like you said about does it make sense and you know what that's the whole thing i don't have to like the storyline i don't have to like the character like it like you know what i um i hope you get a couple shots in but i hope cody kicks your ass on wednesday <laughs> so i mean like that's just being real but sure. but i hope you keep it you keeping it real and and to know that that the company you know um the communication is as good as it seems it means that Sky's the limit. So good luck, Mr. Marshall. And you. Uh, you might want to focus in on the shoulder. Yeah, there you go. There you go. <laughs>